Well, you did say hi in the chat. So Susan's with us as well. Um, I thought rather than have a really structured session at 4.30 in the afternoon, um, I thought it might be a good idea just to talk about the way we, the different ways that the, those of us who are on the call use discussion pre-coronavirus, uh, what we're trying to accomplish, what the instructional goals are. Um, I might have a few things um, to tweak into that as well. Uh, and then I think we can quickly talk about some things for the uh, Moodle discussion forum, for the voice thread, and for, for Zoom. Uh, especially, um, we've had a lot of conversations about Zoom over the last week um, and talking about different ways of actually just handling uh, interactive online conversations in Zoom. But breakout rooms is uh, one thing I haven't been able to have, find the time in workshops to cover. And I think that might be useful, especially how many of you do large, how many of you do full class discussions in your, in your, in your classes? I do. I do. How many of you do small group discussions? I do both. Yeah. So well, I think probably most of us do. And so, uh, I mean, it's one thing to have all of your students in a Zoom session and try to figure out how are you going to figure out who's going to talk when if you're not in the same room and you don't have those cues. But how do you do small group discussions? Well, I think it's worth looking at the, at the breakout room. Um, yeah, this, I'm, actually, I'm recording this one. Uh, I, for those of you who want to do a deeper dive on VoiceThread than what we'll cover in this kind of combined workshop this afternoon, I'll send around a link to the recording for the VoiceThread workshop that we did on Monday. I mean, Robin, you were there on Monday. It was yeah. a good group. Yeah, it was, and it was a good workshop. We covered, I think we covered a whole lot. Yeah. Um, well, the one thing I, I do want to talk about VoiceThread this afternoon, though, is specifically the VoiceThread assignments, which we didn't get to on Monday, because those might be a way in particular to um, promote conversation around the voice threads. Uh, and it might be a way to do structured peer review. I think for Robin, for some of uh, your classwork, you, you do uh, peer reviews. Well, critique, yeah. Critique. Yeah, critique. Um, so there's that. A critique of something visual that everybody, that I want everybody to see and share. So that, that's one of the reasons I'm here is to understand beyond like how the user can do a screen share of their work, put it up for feedback, that sort of thing. Yeah. So there's that. Um, I, I think um, the, the form activity in Moodle, even though it doesn't seem as, as sexy as maybe VoiceThread or, um, or Zoom sessions, there's a lot to be said for asynchronous discussions. So I, I guess most of us, we use discussion in our face-to-face -face classes for a variety of reasons to, you know, solicit different opinions, to do critiques, to brainstorm, to um, provide peer feedback on writing, uh, lots of things like that. Um, even if you, even if we weren't dealing with the virus and, and trying to quickly be able to do remote instruction support for our students online, why might there be an, uh, a reason to add an online discussion forum activity, for example, in Moodle to your face-to-face -face class where you're ha already having conversations and discussions in your face-to-face -face class? What might the advantage of that be? I, I think some students might be more willing to share their views, not face to face. Precisely. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing already, you know, that I, I had a forum up today and I've never used this before. Um, and, I, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm actually finally hearing from some students I haven't heard from all semester, which is amazing. That's I find so when really I do. Cool. 
Yeah, I find when I do uh, whole class discussions in a face-to-face -face class, I actually I have to work to get it not to be the same three voices over and over again. Right. And so I found for a long time, even when I'm, when I'm not teaching online, it's good to have that opportunity to discuss things in a more thoughtful and um, it, well, I, I think like the forum activity in Moodle, it gives those students who don't have the um, confidence or, or the personality to you know, jump right into the, you know, the discussion in class, gives them a time to sit back and think about what they want to say, and compose some thoughts. And Emily, you might be seeing that you're, you're getting some more reflective uh, comments mm -hmm. on, on the forum. So, um, yep. yeah, we, we can go uh, have, have discussions in Zoom. Uh, this is but that, that same problem that we have in the face-to-face -face class of some students not be, being reticent to jump into the, the mm -hmm. give and take of a face-to-face -face discussion, mm -hmm. that's going to be amplified when you, the students are in this unfamiliar environment like Zoom. So even if you are planning to use Zoom and have a, a mix of presentation and, uh, and discussion in your Zoom session, you might want to supplement that with some forum activities in your Moodle course to give those uh, students a chance to sit back, think about the materials, and, and talk. Um, so let, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Keith, is, uh, is there a way that those comments in the forum in Moodle, I've never used that, that they can be private or is it a, like a shared chat? Um, well, the, I, and I'm asking that because in critique, students will be like, I've had them write their critique privately and then like put it in a hat and I read it. Those are okay. much more real than when they think they're hurting their classmates' feelings. Right. So, they need to get over that, but that's, you know. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all colleagues in class. We should have a, a supportive community of learners who can right. say what it needs to be said. But yeah, there are, there are times when it's nice to have some anonymity. Um, when we bring up the new Moodle production server in the fall and skip ahead a couple of versions of Moodle, the discussion forum, the forum activity will have a, several new features, including the ability for you as an instructor to do private responses to po posts, okay, which can't be done in the Moodle 3.6 version that we have, to uh, do a kind of holistic grading of uh, students' uh, participation in the forum with a grading interface very similar to what you would use to grade Moodle assignments. Uh, I have to check to see if an, an uh, anonymous posting is also part of those forum upgrades that we'll be having for the fall. But and I, I don't want I don't want anonymous, but you know what I, I want anonymous to the group, but I want right. private pri whatever however we want to call it like private posting post to post to the teacher, not to the right. I, I mean, I I just want I'm just dancing around it. I don't. Yeah, well, I might not have a solution for that specific thing on the call this afternoon, Robin, but we sure. can certainly- No problem. And I can probably come up with a workaround too. Yeah. So uh, let me share my desktop here. One other quick question. Yep. Um, is, is there a control so students can't record a class? Uh, and not, so they are mean, prevented from you recording? Mean, you mean a Zoom session? Yeah, I just tried. Like, I just tried to record this, and it said I needed your permission. Is there is that a box that uh, you set, or or that no? I can that's set? the default. Oh, good. Okay. So your students will be coming in as participants. They're not going to be able to surreptitiously okay. record. I mean, Great. I can, can send shoot me an email on that. I can confirm that as well. But um, uh, I'm pretty sure that that would be the default. Great. Keith, if you have a document that you want to share, what do I press when I'm on Zoom to get to that document so that I can show it to the class? So if you've got, say, that document up in a, in a Word window, for example, you actually want to give them the file or you want to show them the document? 
Uh, that's the question. Um, I mean, give them as in they can, it'll go to their... Because you can do file sharing through Zoom. We won't walk through that today, but I mean, if you want to distribute a file to students during the session, you can do that. But that's just as easily done by putting the file up in Moodle. If you want to have a document up and so you can show it and, and talk about it during the class, is that what you're asking about? Yes. Or could we, could I pull up Moodle? How do I, how do I change the screen? I guess is what I'm well, saying. Um, let's talk about that offline or are, are okay. I can direct you to the, the workshops that we've done okay. for, for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just screen share. The short of it is it's just screen sharing, screen. Mary, and it's not hard at all. It's really easy. Did you hear me? Yes, thank you. So I want to make a few comments about the uh, forum activity. Again, if you go, if you're editing your Moodle course, click add an activity or resource. You um, can uh, add the forum activity. A couple of things to think about here. For those of you who have used the forum activity in Moodle before, have you switched it away from the default standard forum? I mean, Emily, you, you used forum for the first time today. Did you change? Yeah, I did. I, I tried the best I could to understand the differences, and I, I ended up thinking that the Q&A was what I wanted. Okay. So, um, I think so. I did, but now I don't remember, but I don't think I used that one. So let me okay, give you let me give you a rundown of the different um, forums. So you're adding a forum activity. You would give it a name. There are now five different flavors of, of forum that you can use. Uh, the default is kind of a generalized discussion forum, uh, which means you're creating a bucket for having a place for conversations. And with the standard forum, anyone in the class can start a new discussion thread within this one activity. And then everyone can reply to everyone else. And so you can get multiple different conversations going on in the one forum activity. Let me blow this up a bit. Is that better? Yeah. Sure. Um, so this kind of a discussion forum, I would really pretty much only add this to my Moodle courses if I want to give my students just a place where they can go to post questions and observations about the course in a format that others can talk about, you know, reply to. So I oftentimes set up a standard forum for general use and I call it something like, um, Oh, um, student studio or, or, or general course discussions or depending on how, how in, engaged I'm feeling. Uh, and then it's just there. Um, students, if a student has a question, I oftentimes suggest them, rather than email me that question, why don't you post it to the, to this general discussions forum we've got in class and you might actually get one of the other students you know answering that question for you or I will eventually come in and answer it but then everyone will have the answer so um, that's the default I don't think it's the most useful forum type for instructional activities the two that I would really kind of recommend are this single simple discussion and the Q&A forum if what you're trying to do is give your students a, a, an open-ended discussion prompt that you want an extended unified conversation about, I would recommend doing this single simple discussion. There aren't multiple threads. The problem with the standard discussion forum is 
let's say you want the students to discuss campus response to coronavirus and you put up a standard discussion forum. Susan might come in and start the first thread and talk about, uh, you know, what impact this is going to have on performance classes and so forth. And fr Frank might come in and reply to her talking about, you know, dining services where and then George comes in later and starts a new thread about, you know, what's going to happen to our meal plans when the campus uh, goes into this lockdown. So the conversation gets spread across all these different threads and it's more difficult to get a sense of who's talking to whom and, and so forth. So it's great for a kind of a general discussion. Hey, I had a question about, uh, you know, what we were talking about, about metamorphic rocks. I had this question and everyone can pile in, but it's not so good for um, actual questions. So if, if you had, uh, you know, again, if you have a, a, a general open-ended prompt you want everyone to jump in on, the single simple discussion sets up one thread. Your prompt is the thread. And then everyone is either re replying to your initial prompt or to other uh, comments that people have made on that. Um, so it's really good for philosophical open-ended, there's no right, wrong answer kind of, but, but I, I, I want you to um, post your perspective and, and, and back it up and defend it, that kind of open-ended discussion. I have a question. Um, yeah. okay. um, so this is like the instructor is still the one who's leading the conversation. And the, well, the, the instructor is giving the prompt. And well, one thing I would, let's put a pin in that. One thing I want to get back to is what should your role be in, in these online discussions? But let, let, let me come back. To okay. That. All right. So, um, Keith, I don't know if it is this one, but the one I did, I remember, I would have a prompt and then everyone would have to reply, um, but no one could see that first reply until they had replied. That's yep. what I was thinking too. I was that's, wondering about that too. That's the next one. That's the oh. other main uh, okay. forum type that I think is useful for our instructional uses of the forum. Uh, it's called Q&A or question and answer forum because the threads are questions that you pose and then the students reply to those as answers. And it does have the really very nice feature that you create the, the discussion forum and then you add one or more questions as the threads that are in there. Susan comes in and goes to your first question thread, reads your question, posts her reply, and her reply is there um, as, as, a, as an answer. Frank, I guess I'm doing Susan and Frank all the time. Frank comes in later and he goes into your second question, he posts a response, goes back out to the main forum, goes into the first question, and he will see your question, and he will see that someone has supplied a follow-up answer, but he doesn't see who or what until he posts his response to the forum, to that, to that question. Even though he answered question number two, he doesn't see the other students' answers on question one until he gives his answer. And then once that answer is you know, um, finalize, and he can't come back in and edit it, which I think is, we used to be set at five minutes, but I think we've got it at 30 minutes now. When he comes back in later, after that time period, back into the same question, he sees his, but he also sees Susan's response, and at that point, he can reply to Susan's response. So, um, again, if it's kind of a, just a one unified open-ended discussion you want, use the single simple discussion. If it's a Q&A forum, if you want students to have to make some contribution, 
before they can see what other students have contributed, then you can use the Q&A form. Um, there are lots of uh, settings that I don't think we need to talk about for today's workshop, but you can, you can require that um, everyone in, is initially subscribed to a discussion forum so that they see what activity is going on. And um, they can always opt out later, but at least they, they are initially notified when people are posting. So that's push, Moodle pushes that notification to them? Yeah. It, okay. if, if you subscribe to a discussion forum, or in the current version of Moodle, you can actually subscribe to an individual thread, um, then any activity on that thread or that forum gets mailed out to your um, email. So when I'm, as an instructor, if I don't know that all my students are coming in at a given time and they're going to be focusing their conversation, you know, around these two days, um, if it's a forum that might extend over more time, I make sure that I subscribe myself to the forum so that when students, you know, three days down the road do post something, I, I know about it. Um, and so if I just uh, click save and display for the single simple discussion, there, there is no ability to create additional threads. You know, the, well, actually, I, I should have actually put in a prompt. The, dis the description of the forum is the prompt. Mm -hmm. And so students come in, they would see that, they would have an option to reply. The first student in, all they can do is reply to my initial prompt. The second student in can reply to my, my initial prompt or they can reply to the first student uh, reply. And you, you, so you get this nice threaded uh, students replying to students kind of conversation going on. Um, so can that's I ask that. a question about the subscriptions? Yeah. Um, so I set up my Q&A forum and I mean I saw that the subscriptions were one of the options but I didn't change anything so it's on whatever the default was and I'm getting emails every time anyone posts anything and and I think I'd prefer not to get the emails right. that just to check so what what subscription preference would I set it to so that well, I you, don't get the email? you could just go in and unsubscribe yourself I mean, every one of those emails that come to you should have an option for you to opt out and unsubscribe. Oh, okay. In the email itself? In the email itself. Okay. And uh, if, I want, if I set up a new one and I want to do it so that, that I'm not getting the emails, then I want to choose... Uh, well, it, when you do your initial post, every time you post to a forum, you get the option, do you want to be subscribed to that post or not? And so when you're actually doing the initial post, when, when you did your, Q, your, your questions for the Q&A forum, uh, you want to make sure that, um, well, let me actually set up a Q&A forum here. And I'll save and display. And the one problem that fact, the one issue that comes up when faculty use Q and A forums is they set up the Q and A forum, but they never add the questions. They might have a discussion prompt as part of the description of the forum, and they think that's the question. When you do a Q and A forum, the description of the forum is not the question. So you have to add the question. So here's you know question one. And here's, you know, what I want to say about it. And uh, Okay, it looks like subscription to the discussion is not checked by default. So, so Emily, we, sh we should send me an email. I'll take a look at your forums and we will see why you, you may be getting, but if you want to be, if you do post something and you definitely want to be notified whenever somebody 
replies to it, you can you can select that. You can add <laughs> attachments. Um, you can pin a particular post so that it's always at the top. That's not so important for this Q and A. Um, but if I post that to the forum, then there will be a question. If if Frank came in here now, he would see. Oh, here's question one. It was started by my instructor. I can go in here and uh, reply. And once my reply is permanent, then I can come in and see other students' replies. Can you show that on your student view of your Moodle page? Um, actually, I should have prepared and had another browser open where I could actually log in as a student. Um, you know how you go, you can navigate to student view. Yeah. Uh, but okay, never mind. If you, I don't want to mess you up. No, that's okay. Uh, you can switch role to student. And okay. if I go in to this forum, uh, this is what students will see. This is a Q&A form. In order to see responses to questions, you must first post yours. So oh, that's, I mean, that's actually kind of nice. I, I think that has, hasn't always been there for the students, but it makes it pretty clear to the students now. I got to go in, I got to answer, and then later I can see. So it takes 30 minutes for them to see the response? I need to check on that. We used to have it set really short. And I had a question from a faculty member earlier this year, and I didn't get back to it because I've been swamped, uh, other than I need to look into it. It was looking like the students weren't able to see each other's responses until much after five minutes, more like the 30 minutes. Um, don't wanna, I don't want to spend this whole time talking about forums, but I do just want to uh, say a couple of things. One thing I see with faculty is when they set up a discussion forum is they put this place up with prompts for students. Let's say I've got this Q&A forum set up. And Susan comes in and adds a response. Should I respond to students right away? Is it good practice to respond to students quickly or not when you're trying to do a discussion forum? I don't know if it's good practice or not, but I don't want to. You don't, <laughs> don't want to. I don't want to set up the expectation that, you know, we're. I'm on call. I'm actually going to tell you, Robin, you're in good standing because I think that's bad practice. <laughs> Why would it be bad practice for me as an instructor to say, oh, a, a student has replied to the form here. I should go in and, and say something. Why, why is that bad pedagogically? I want to hear what they say. Right. Right. I want them to hear my answer. I mean, if you're constantly in there replying to students, the students are never going to have a conversation with each other. Right. Mm -hmm. right. If you never go in and reply, is that good practice? No. No. So you have to find the balance. Right? Uh, how often do I need to go in to see what conversation is taking place? Uh, how can I strategically res respond to specific students to shape the conversation? And definitely, if something objectionable is going on, or if the conversation is going off in the wrong way, you want to get in there and, and do. That's what I did this in this afternoon. Just you know, take one or two pertinent ones yep. and respond to that. Not to everybody, you know. Not to everybody. When are we getting the grades back and blah blah blah? And you know, the thing among themselves. Oh, she's going to do this, that, and the other. Yep. Ignore it. Yep. So yeah, you know, find that middle ground. The other thing is, uh, and, and I won't take time to talk about this, but there is, uh, you have to figure out how you're going to grade student participation on discussion forums. Um, because uh, you know, one student, if you've got this simple, single, simple discussion where it's kind of an open-ended discussion, one student might post one really excellent post to the forum and never post anything else. And you might have another student who posts 20 different things, but they're all meaningless. Mm. You know, where's the, the balance between quality and quantity? 
uh, or oftentimes... Oh, you, you have that student too? I have that student. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's another approach that, that, stu that faculty who are taking their courses online in a more intentional online uh, learning kind of format. I'm going to set up the discussion forum. You, you, there's going to be a discussion forum each week. And students are required to post one initial uh, reply and two follow-up replies to other student postings. And the first post has to be at least 100 words. And the follow-ups have to be you know, at least you know, 20 words each. What's good about that? approach to getting to providing a framework for student participation? Well, it's very specific and then it, it means that no student, every student will do a certain amount of participation and no student will sort of dominate the conversation. Right. What's the limitation of that? If you, if you say every student needs to do one original post and two follow-ups, what are you going to get from 90% of the students? Exactly that, right? Exactly that. One original post and two follow-ups. So it provides some expectation, but in some respects, it can also kind of set a ceiling for a number of students. So I mean, that's, a, that's a tough nut to crack. But is the, does, does at least help, or will they still yes. just do, you know... Uh, I, I, I approach it in a couple of different ways. One, uh, one way will be to say, you know, a, an adequate uh, participation in the forum would be, you know, an original post and follow-ups to a couple of your student responses. Adequate is not 100%. If you want to, if you want to get a really good grade on the forum, you need to go above and beyond. So. I mean, whatever language works best for you, uh, you need to work it out. Uh, that's true to how you arrange your classes. But do realize that's, that's an issue. If you don't say anything, students might be lost uh, or they might you know, have no expectations of participating. If you're and really specific, that might be they do that and nothing else. And that's for the simple forum? Is that that's right? For any, that's for any forum. That's just a general issue you need to think about when you're using discussion forums. Uh, because with an assignment, you know, they're submitting a paper and you've got the criteria for the paper. It's not like one student submits one paper and another student submits eight papers. Right? So uh, you've got less control over the number and quantity and quality of uh, forum posts. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the new version of Moodle where there's kind of a holistic grading um, uh, back, uh, interface for the discussion forum. Uh, I can say, okay, we're going to we're going to discuss on the forum for the you know this next week. At the end of the week, I'm going to go in. I'm going to pull up each student one at a time, and the, the grading uh, interface will give me all of that student's posts. And I can go more of a kind of a gestalt. You know, this is really A work, so you get 10 out of 10. This was okay, I'm going to give you eight, um, so forth. Okay. So, so I think that's, that's as much time as I want to focus on the discussion forum. But, you know, do think of, of putting a certain amount of asynchronous discussion into your class. Doesn't all have to be just synchronous, let's get the class together and Zoom and discuss, because not only um, is this more flexible for students, but it will bring out students that you probably won't get um, uh, shining in uh, discussions in Zoom or your face. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, Keith, I mean, in fact, I'm thinking for, for a class like college writing, um, do you think there's anything wrong at this point with not doing any synchronous activities? I mean, if, if I don't do any Zoom, if I, you know, really lean on the forums and, and submitting in assignments and things like that with clear instructions, is, is it a problem not to have anything taking there, place there live? Is, there is no requirement for real-time remote instruction 
for it to be a set of learning activities that meet the learning outcomes of your class. But, you know. but Emily, can I? Yeah. Because Keith, the only thing I would say is that, um, and I've only done one so far, but if you did a check-in maybe in three weeks or where you could just see, look them in the eyes and see, yeah. you know, there is a thing, um, like some of the stuff with Zoom, like need a break, or there's just some stuff that, that I liked about that gave it a little humanity. Yeah. And because I think, especially since we're experimenting and don't know how it's working, there's something about Zoom and being able to see people and, you know, see, you, do you know what I mean? Body yeah. language and whatever to kind of gauge, like, how, hey, I just thought I'd check in today, see, see everybody, how are y'all doing? How, how's this feel to you? And have an open, like, live, discussion could be really invigorating. So Robin, that was the second half of what I was going to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> then we're like this, Keith. We're we are like this. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, clearly, to the extent that you can incorporate synchronous face-to-face -face activities online in a meaningful way, it, it increases your instructor presence and it increases the social presence of the students. Now, in, in our case here, our classes have been meeting face to face for most for much of the semester. So hopefully there's already a sense of, uh, of uh, community of learners. If you're going to do a fully online course from the beginning, you have to think about what's the mix of asynchronous and synchronous that will really let my students bond. But yeah. For a lot of your work, you can really push the forums, you can push the assignments. Uh, there are peer review assignments in Moodle that I'm not sure, I don't know whether or not you're, you're aware of, Emily, but judiciously calling everyone together into a Zoom session can really give everyone a sense of we're still a class, we're not just individuals cranking away on all of these work products. Right, so it might be worth trying to fit in a few, maybe. Yeah. 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 I also um, think you, I, I was just going to say, I also think you could use the Zoom to kind of launch something and then move into yeah. um, the forum mode, or like I was thinking about moving into written chat still on Zoom, but not a, you know, an oral conversation and just seeing how that goes. Yeah. So, I mean, we're all going to have to find our way, what, what mix uh, works best for us. Um, so uh, Zoom breakout rooms or voice thread? Breakout rooms. Breakout rooms. OK. Uh, and if we don't get to voice thread, um, gonna... that's, only, that's only an hour. And just if you listen to that, that'll be. Yeah. And since we didn't do it earlier today, Keith, I just wanted to. Yeah. So it, like I was going to say, if we don't get to it, um, uh, I will send around the link to the right. thread um, workshop. It was a great group. We had a great discussion on Monday. So uh, we've got not a huge class online here. Uh, I thought for breakout rooms, what I would do is actually just uh, go through the process and put you in breakout rooms. And then I will take some screenshots as we're doing that. So you get the experience of how the breakout rooms work first. And then when we come back into the main room, I'll pull up the um, screenshots to actually walk you through the process of doing it. It is really pretty simple. First of all, if you go back to what we talked about in the, in the Zoom uh, class workshop earlier, if you're going to use breakout rooms in Zoom, you have to go into your account and make sure in the account settings that breakout rooms are turned on. So log on to your account with the credentials that CTS has given you at zoom.us and click on account settings and scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. There's a ton of account settings. And down toward the two thirds way down, there will be enable breakout rooms. And for some reason, it's off by default. I, you know, this would be one of the things that I would, would have on. But anyways, um, to- four. Wait, account profile, where'd you say? 
Uh, you can do it later, Rob. It's under okay. Attendance settings. Okay, I'll do it later. Um, I'm what I'm. I'll describe what I'm doing, and you'll see the screenshots later. At the bottom of my toolbar, there is a, a, a an option for breakout rooms, and it pops up a little create breakout rooms option. Um, it, we've got nine participants on the call. It's going to ask, do I want to manually put people into breakout rooms, or do I want them just automatically partitioned by Zoom? Uh, it probably will take too long to do manually. I'm just going to do automatically. I'm going to actually do three breakout rooms. There should be three participants per room. And I'll create the rooms. I lost the screen. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, so actually, I forgot to take a screenshot. So I'm going to, oh crap. Uh, Keith, I just clicked on something at the top of my browser and I lost you. Where do I, where do I go? Um, you're you're going to have to go back and find the Zoom window. Are you on Mac or Windows? I'm on Mac. I mean, if you're on Mac, you can do control uh, command tab to cycle through the open applications. And on, on Windows, Windows, there's a thing on the bottom. Yeah, if you're on Windows, there should be a, a, the, the, the application tray at the bottom where you, you see what's active and open, and you need to click on the, on the Zoom room again. So, um, hmm. um, well, I'll just take a screenshot now. Are so you, did you did you break us up? I, I, I'm working on that. I created okay. three rooms. Uh, I had Zoom randomly put uh, three of you into each sure. room. So in breakout room one, there's going to be Arena, Robin, and Susan. In breakout room two, it's going to be Ellen, Mary, and Pat. And in breakout room three, it's Emily, Kim, and Marie. Um, let me take another screenshot. Uh, when I click open all rooms, you should now have been yes. gotten an invitation. And you are now disappearing from my screen as, as soon as you click on that, because I'm still in the main room. Oh, I stepped away, Keith, and I, I missed what you said, but I figured out how to come back. You're, I... you're, you're back in the main room. So go back and join your room. I'm, I'm actually going to go come around to each of the rooms. Okay. You, did you, you say anything? That. Did you say anything after you said, you probably said, go ahead and click. Okay. Go ahead and click. Yeah. Okay. I'm a, yeah. I'm in the breakout room too. Oh, yeah. me too. As am I. So one thing, as a host, you could set up the breakout rooms, and then um, uh, when the participants all go off to the breakout room, you're still in the main room, but you have the ability to join any given room. So I'm going to I joined room one just to say hi, and now I'm going to leave the breakout that breakout room and return to the. So one thing oh, I hey. see. Hey, hey Keith. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. So can, can so, I ask I'm a sorry. question? Sure. So uh, two two things I noticed right away. One is, can you set a time? Like, do you set a time for how long you're gonna you, talk, or do you come back on? And the other thing is, we were all talking at once. <laughs> yeah. So. so so you would ideally give some kind of a prompt for what conversation is going on in the breakout room. You would tell student, your, you would tell your participants, I'm going to leave these breakout rooms open for, you know, five minutes. And then um, I'll talk about this when I get everyone back in the main room. You have, when you're back in the main room, you have the ability to close down the breakout rooms. Everyone gets a minute warning saying the breakout room is going to close and, and they're directed back to the main room. So I'm going to leave you now. I'm going to go back because I still have to go to room three. Okay.
So I've popped into room one and two already, and now I'm in room three. And uh, I don't know if, if if Marie's on the on the mic or not because uh, she's been sick. So you maybe have been chatting or uh, here alone. But uh, I just want to show that you know as you uh, create the breakout sessions, you um, you know, your participants go off, you stay in the main room, but you have the ability to pop into any of the breakout rooms and then leave them and go back to the main room, which is what I'm gonna do right now so that I can close the breakout rooms and bring everyone back to the main room. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to envision like how, how people use it, like just to allow smaller groups to talk. Yeah, it would be like small group discussion. So if you've got, uh, the situation where you want, you know, students in groups of two or three to talk about something first and then, you know, maybe nominate someone to be a spokesperson for that group and then you bring everyone back and then you, you bring the, the small group conversations into the, into the main room. So I'm going to go back to the main session and close down the breakout room so we can all come back. Oh my gosh, Janet, yeah. 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 They kind of both, Janet, but you see, the computer science one is for majors also. So it's kind of more dedicated people. Mm -hmm. so I see some of you are back in the main room. I just sent a message that the breakout rooms are all closing and it gives a 60 second countdown. Oh, okay. And invites everyone to come back into the main room. Where did you, where, once we set this up, will that, will that option be pretty apparent? Yeah. I wasn't as judicious about uh, taking screenshots as as I meant to be, so I missed some parts of it. Um, but let's see what screenshots I did get. We'll forgive only, you. Is it right? Only the host can can do break, like you know, make yeah. breakout groups happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if you have a um, if you have a learning assistant in your course, which or, or do some of the college writing courses have, right? Uh, yeah, yeah when, I have it both. Yeah, so if you're doing a Zoom session, you, you set it up, you, you are the host for the session, but um, when your learning assistant comes in, you can make, you can make them host as well. So they are, are a host. Uh, did you see Susan's question about, she says her microphone isn't working, but she can't figure out, or she wants, she teaches Spanish and she needs to find a way to promote discussion and interactive conversation. So, um, yeah, Susan, are you back in the main room? She, her mic's off. Yeah. Or her mic's broken. Um, Certainly, if you're doing a Zoom session, you could have the you know, students turn their mics on and you can have a uh, conversation, interactive conversation discussion. You can break them up into small groups the way we did with the breakout rooms. Uh, uh, VoiceThread actually is very popular, very popular among language uh, teachers because, um, I mean, you could set up a VoiceThread that has um, you know, like four slides, and each slide has a different picture of urban life in Madrid, mm -hmm. you know, in the 21st century. And you set up that voice thread and uh, have your students go in, and it doesn't have to be, it, voice thread is, again, another asynchronous activity, but um, you could have uh, the students look at each of the slides in turn and turn on their microphone and uh, just describe what they see or discuss the, you know, what they see in the pictures. And with those student comments on the, on the media that you're presenting in the voice thread, you can actually have threaded conversations there. So again, if good old Susan is the first one in to the voice thread and she sees slide number one, and records, you know, like a little two-minute segment uh, uh, in Spanish of what she sees there. When Frank comes in to view the voice thread, 
he can listen to the commentary that Susan made and do a comment, a comment that is not just a generic comment on the slide, but is a comment to her comment. And you can actually build up those nested comments in VoiceThread as well. Again, I don't think we will take the time to look at VoiceThread this afternoon because we're already bumping up on 5.30, but I will send around a link to everyone for the, the VoiceThread workshop. And uh, I don't think the screenshots I took because I wasn't thinking well enough as I set up the break rooms uh, during the session here are good. I will go through the process again, set up a series of, of screenshots. But if you, let me tell you this, if you go into your Zoom account and you activate the break uh, out session um, and then start up your own personal meeting room, you'll see the breakout tool there. Just click on it, you'll see how easy it is to automatically set up breakouts. Now you won't have a number of, you won't have a lot of students to break up into those rooms, but it's basically, how many rooms do you want in relationship to the number of participants? Do you want to manually move people to breakout rooms or you want Zoom to do it randomly? And then you just open the rooms and people are invited to move from the main room to the um, to their individual break room. I just can't find where that little thing is on my account profile. Uh, to be able to create. Not, not, not on your account profile. Click on account settings. Okay. And then under the meeting tab under account settings. You okay, have got a whole, it. Whole long list of settings. And got it, got it, got it. Okay, I'm there now. Thanks. So, um, I mean, hopefully, this workshop has been a mix of some pedagogical discussion about how you can think about facilitating conversation online, why you might want to have a mix of asynchronous discussion and synchronous discussion, and then I mean, there are lots of tools you can use for that, but we've got some main ones that are already available to you. We've got the, the standard built-in uh, core form activity in Moodle. I mean, every learning management system is gonna have a, a forum or a discussion forum activity because that is so key to online learning, to have the ability for students to, to have these extended conversations. Um, you know, if you use Zoom, you can, you have to figure out how you, you know, how you want to manage the uh, flow of conversation if you're trying to have a whole class discussion. If you've got 25 students and they're all online and they've got their microphones, you know, how do you handle who's going to talk next? Do you set up a protocol where, you know, students raise their hand and you follow the participant list to see you know, who's at the top of the list with their hand raised and you call on them for them to, you're going to have to probably manage the conversation in some way. Uh, but you also have the ability to break out uh, the large class into small breakout rooms. And if, if, you know, there are two or three or four people in a breakout room, you want to give them, you know, what do you want them to talk about? What is the what is the outcome, the goal that you want them to be working toward? Uh, are they answering some question? Are they developing some perspective? Have them come up with someone to report out on the discussion. And then when you bring them back into the main room, bring all the rooms back together, you can call on those, uh, you know, the people who are, have been thrown under the bus to be the people reporting out can raise their hand and you can call on them and they can talk about what was going on in the conversation, you know, in our uh, breakout room. Um, and then for VoiceThread, you know, it's a good way, it's kind of in between the Moodle forum and the uh, real-time conversation in, uh, in Zoom. It is technically an asynchronous conversation, but because students are, are getting on their webcam or they are getting on um, uh, their microphone to actually talk 
or uh, uh, um, about their response rather than just typing up text in a discussion forum, it seems more engaging. Just by reading, uh, it seems more engaging than um, uh, just typing into a text-based form. So it is asynchronous. Students can come in whenever they want, but at, in the same time. Um, it has a little bit more social presence than just typed responses to a discussion forum. Um, Keith, are you are you going to post chats along with the um, the recordings? Because there's some useful links that Marie's been populating the chats. With. Yeah, we uh, I've got our Zoom account set to automatically download the chat. We've got them. Uh, we'll put them up along with. Great. We'll they, that'd, be very, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question, Keith. Yeah. So we, we log in and so um, I'm going to Zoom. How do we get into Zoom? You, you, if you haven't gotten a Zoom account from CTS, that's your first step. So I emailed them for it. Email them. Bye, everybody, and thanks. Yep. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Keith.